the Cisco Certified Design Associate Bootcamp here at INE. My name is Anthony Sequera, and I am thrilled that you are joining us for day five in our CCDA Bootcamp. Got a lot of material left to discuss today. We're going to take a look at our further exploration of our routing protocols. We'll be looking at OSPF and ISIS in this particular lesson. Then we'll turn our attention to BGP. And then we wrap it up with some very interesting kind of odds and ends in the CCDA bootcamp. We'll take a look at security and talk about something that you're going to love called the security life cycle. We'll talk a bit about voice over IP. We've mentioned it a lot in this course, but we'll really zero in on it. And then we wrap up the entire event with a look at wireless technologies. But we, we really do have a bias in here, as you've gotten a sense for, for two modules, right? Two modules really were the meat of the course, and that was wide area networks and our IP addressing and routing protocols. That is definitely the bias in the CCDA, and that's with good reason. These principles really do make up the very, very most important design elements that we need to consider. After all, some of you may never implement wireless LANs. You may never implement voice over IP in your infrastructures. But all these other technologies, we definitely, definitely are going to be faced with. Well, OSPF, this is going to be a little bit lengthier of a discussion, certainly lengthier than RIP or EIGRP, because there is a lot going on with OSPF. There's a lot of design principles that we need to understand. We said EIGRP was complex and sophisticated. Yes, yeah, so is OSPF. As a matter of fact, it's much more complex. There's just, by the very nature of it, there's a lot more to learn when it comes to OSPF. OSPF, Open Shortest Path First, is a standard routing protocol. We mention this because we remember EIGRP is not an open standard. We know EIGRP used something called the diffusing update algorithm, a Cisco invention, and OSPF, it uses something called Dijkstra's shortest path first algorithm. Uh, something else with OSPF, it is indeed, of course, classless, which means it's going to be able to support that variable length subnet masking, and it is going to be able to support the summarization techniques. It's guaranteed to be loop-free. Dijkstra's shortest path-first algorithm takes care of that. It is standards-based, like we said, and it is really designed to be very, very scalable. One of the criteria that we looked at earlier was, is your routing protocol going to be hierarchical, or is it going to be flat? We said hierarchical would be better for purposes of scalability. And OSPF is the poster child when it comes to hierarchical. OSPF is definitely, as we'll see, a completely hierarchical protocol in its nature. It might not converge as fast as EIGRP, but it does offer us efficient convergence and efficient updating. And it does, thank goodness, take bandwidth into consideration for its metric of cost. A higher bandwidth gives you a lower cost, and lower costs in OSPF are better. Just like our other protocols, it can indeed support authentication. In fact, the only protocol we saw that didn't in this course was uh, the RIP version 1 protocol. I don't think IGRP supports authentication either, by the way but IGRP isn't even supported on a lot of Cisco equipment these days. So anyways, we know OSPF can indeed support authentication, thank goodness. The other really interesting thing about OSPF is that like BGP and like the ISIS protocol, it's extensible. Extensible is a cool word, which means that the protocol can be modified in the future to handle other forms of traffic. All right, let's go ahead and discuss the OSPF process, by the way. OSPF will discover OSPF neighbors and exchange topology information with these neighbors. So, by the way, it's a lot like EIGRP in that regard. 
Remember, RIP didn't establish neighborships, did it, with the other routers? RIP was just either broadcasting in the case of version one or multicasting in the case of version two information out to whoever is going to be listening. With OSPF, like EIGRP, there is this concept of neighborship. They exchange topology information, these neighbors, and then OSPF goes to work calculating the best paths to destinations using the shortest path first algorithm. There has to be a mechanism in place, and there is, for maintaining your neighbors and your topology table. The shortest path first calculation, this occurs and is going to use the cost attribute. We know based on bandwidth in order to figure out the best path to get to each link out there. Everything typically is modifiable in Cisco networking, right? And certainly cost is no exception to that. There is a formula that Cisco's OSPF uses by default. It's 100 megabits per second called the reference bandwidth that is divided by the link bandwidth that you either set or that is default on the link. We can indeed modify how this is done. So if for some reason you needed to, you could. And why might you design this into the network? Well, if your networks have like one gigabit links and 10 gigabit links and 40 gigabit links, this default Cisco cost calculation will not be adequate for your environment. If link bandwidth is being divided into the relatively slow 100 megabits per second, you're not gonna get different costs for one gig versus 10 gig versus 40 gig. So it's great that we can design into our OSPF implementation a new cost formula for these very high speed OSPF environments. Now, something that we did mention about OSPF, it certainly adds to the complexity of design, but we do like the fact that OSPF can be configured to behave differently depending on the topology you are implementing it in. OSPF recognizes different network types. And the different network types will govern and control things like how updates get sent out, how many adjacencies are made between the OSPF speakers, how the next hop will be calculated. So all of these important underpinnings of OSPF will be manipulated based on the OSPF network type. There's six, we mentioned five before in the course, but when you get right down to it, there is six of these. Broadcast, non-broadcast, point to point, point to multi-point, point to multi-point, non-broadcast, and there's even a special one called loopback that as you might guess, is the default network type on loopback interfaces. OSPF does a good job of selecting the network type that is most appropriate for a given technology. For instance, no surprise, if you were to set up OSPF on a broadcast-based Ethernet network, it would default to the broadcast type. Just like if you were to set it on a frame relay physical interface, it would default to the non-broadcast type. Just like if you were to set it up on a point-to-point -point protocol serial link, it would default to the point-to-point -point network type. So OSPF does a pretty good job in Cisco's implementation of automatically setting it up, attempting to, for the appropriate technology. It will automatically set loopback on a loopback, for example. Notice two that are never automatic are the point-to-multipoint and point-to-multipoint non-broadcast. These are most appropriate for partial mesh environments or hub and spoke and we have to go in and manually configure these network types. I wanted to cover in detail with you at least one of these so you could get a sense at the CCDA level for just how these network types can influence the underlying OSPF protocol. We know the broadcast type is gonna be the default on broadcast media, and right away something very interesting starts happening. They, 
the, the systems will elect a designated router and a backup designated router on the particular broadcast segment. In order to communicate to these designated routers, OSPF will multicast updates to 224.006, and to communicate with everybody else that's not a designated router or a backup designated router, it will use 224.005. Interesting. So in a broadcast network, there's this special election process for this designated router and this backup designated router. Here's what's going on here. The designated router is the device on the broadcast network that all the other routers will form their adjacency with. And this is a protection mechanism against the network being overwhelmed with adjacencies. I mean, what if you had 50 OSPF speakers on a broadcast segment? You'd have absolute chaos. You'd have 50 times 49 divided by two. You'd have that number of full mesh adjacencies, and you'd get into a real, real problem with overhead due to the OSPF protocol in that particular situation. So what they've done here cleverly is they've said, okay, well, in a broadcast-based network, we'll go ahead and make it much more efficient. We'll have devices just establish their adjacency with the DR. What's the DR all, uh, what's the BDR all about? Excuse me, what's the backup designated router all about? Well, sure enough, it's just there in the event that the designated router fails. It's just going to be there to fill in for the designated router should there be a failure. So again, on a broadcast OSPF segment, if everybody were to have to form adjacencies for the information exchange with everybody else, it would get real messy real quick. I mean, I'm just drawing the adjacencies for one of the routers in this environment We'd then draw these lines for every single router to have that full mesh of adjacencies. Thanks to the DR and BDR concept, everyone goes, okay, look, I'm going to send an update to the DR, R1. And R3 is like, okay, I'm going to do the same thing. R5 is like, I'm going to do the same thing. R4 would be like, I'm going to do the same thing. And then that device can be the one that's responsible for telling everybody else about a particular update. So it is a much more efficient process with this designated router concept on the network. And this is obviously a key design element that you need to understand. Also, what we love about OSPF is its hierarchical nature. So it uses the concept of areas to add hierarchy and to really improve the scalability of the protocol. You see, we know that link state protocols, as we described earlier in the course, we know that they are going to operate by machines flooding information about the status of their links. But when we divide into areas, it's just the area that has to agree on that map of the topology. So it's really cool by setting up areas, we reduce the convergence domain sizing. And the protocol just becomes much more efficient. We also have the ability to hide topology details. This is what I mean by the convergence domain, right? As we organize into areas, we can hide topology details from other areas and therefore reduce the overall size of the convergence domain. And when we do this, we are improving the overall efficiency of the protocol. There is an absolutely critical area in the OSPF environment called the OSPF backbone area. It is got to be numbered. You have no choice here. The backbone must be area zero. So when you're first designing someone's OSPF infrastructure, you have to start with area zero, really, right? Because if they are going to grow later on and build different areas, they have to have an area zero. So it's traditional that we start with this area zero concept. 
The area zero is called the transit area because notice traffic from another area to another area has to go through area zero. And it must be contiguous, meaning you can't break area zero up in two parts and all areas must touch area zero because it's the transit area. Once you've designed your area zero, you can go ahead and design other areas and we simply refer to these as non-transit areas. They can be numbered uh, anything you want. There, there's obviously a finite scope for the numbering, but it's, it's uh, really big. So you can number these other areas anything you want. And remember, they have to feature connectivity to the area zero. So uh, something that we need to master as a CCDA is the different router roles that we have within OSPF. Okay? We have to master the roles of these different routers. The, the name, the terminology we give to a router that has at least one connection to the backbone area, area zero, <laughs> surprise, surprise, it gets called a backbone router. So if your router has at least one link in backbone zero, this router is known as the, or as a backbone router in your topology. If you have a router that has all links participating in one non-transit area, it's called an internal router. So if we've got a router that like lives in on backbone area, like I said, every single interface on this router is, is, uh, is participating in that area 10. This is what we call an internal router. So at least one interface in the backbone, you're considered a backbone router. Congratulations. All interfaces participating in a non-backbone area, you're considered an internal router. Congratulations. By the way, if you're a router that sits between multiple areas, you're what's called an area border router. Now, very important router called an area border router. This means you've got at least one link in area zero. By definition, you have to touch area zero if you're an ABR. And you've got at least one link in a non-transit area. ABRs are so, so critical. These area border routers are going to be responsible for passing information between the non-transit area and area zero. There are links to summarize it, and they can obviously really, really improve the efficiency and the scalability of our OSPF design. Another special router type we have to master with OSPF is the Autonomous System Boundary Router, the ASBR. The ASBR has at least one link to another OSPF domain. So it's got at least one link that reaches out to like an EIGRP cloud or an ISIS cloud or a BGP cloud. Ah, so the ASBR has one link in the backbone or the non-transit area, and then it's got at least one link that touches the external routing domain. Obviously, the autonomous system boundary router is important for bringing in, redistributing information from the other routing domains into the OSPF cloud. Remember what we said, one of the important design considerations with OSPF is that absolutely all of the non-transit areas must touch area zero. If this is to break for some reason, okay, we create what's called a virtual link. This is a band-aid and it's kind of like an area zero tunnel. A virtual link allows you to tunnel, basically, the area zero to reach that area that's having the design flaw. Pretty interesting concept. And I say it's a band-aid. It's nothing that you would want to set out to design, 
But what often happens with our OSPF designs is we might merge with another company, right? So let's say like we have our area zero in OSPF, and then we have like this non-transit area, area 100. Now we merge with another company and we bring in their area zero. We've got a problem. As you can see, area zero is discontinuous. It is broken. So a temporary fix is to create on these area border routers. So we've got two area border routers in this design. We've got one between area zero and area 100, and then we've got one between area 100 and the other area zero. We create a virtual link. between those ABRs. This virtual link tunnels the area zero between the devices, so temporarily at least, the topology is repaired. Pretty darn cool. Uh, and we'll probably want to go ahead and redesign things so that we can eventually do away with the virtual link, but this is definitely a technique that we might have to rely on as like a temporary band-aid until we can do the redesign. Another classic case where we might have a virtual link is in our own area. Let's say we have an area zero, our own domain without a company merger, we have an area 10, and then for whatever reason, we have to set up an area 20 out here. Notice we have another design problem. The non-transit area, area 20, doesn't touch area zero. Uh-oh. So we have to go ahead on the ABR here and on the ABR here, we have to go ahead and do a virtual link so that area 20 does touch the area back, uh, the backbone area through the virtual link. So virtual links, important band-aids, important tools that we have in our tool belt in order to avoid design flaws that can crop up when we are not properly designing or when we don't have a proper implementation of the OSPF process there. Something else that we need to realize with OSPF, wow, lots of information here. I told you this was a lot more complicated to study than like EIGRP, and it is. Another concept that we have with OSPF is different link state advertisement types. Yeah, different link state advertisement types. You see, uh, when we advertise information in OSPF, it all depends if we're advertising uh, one of our little local links versus some external route from another domain. The different types of information that we advertise in OSPF it gets one of these different LSA types, which literally has a unique format. This is best explained by, let me just go ahead and show you the examples of LSAs that we have. When a router in an area advertises a link to another router in an area, it uses a fundamental building block LSA, I like to call it. It's called a router LSA, and it's called an LSA type one. So when I tell a router in my area about one of my links, I use this type 1 LSA in order to do it. When a domain, uh, when a DR, when a designated router, when a designated router uh, sends an update about the routers that it is attached to, this is a network. LSA, a type 2 LSA. So you're only going to have these where a designated router is used, like in a broadcast segment, for example. When we go to advertise via the area border router, when we go to advertise information from one area to another, a type 3 LSA is used. In order to tell everyone in the domain that there's an autonomous system boundary router, that reaches out to another technology, like maybe it reaches out to a RIP area, heaven forbid, okay? The 
LSA that is used to tell everyone about the type four is a, uh, a the LSA type that is used to tell everyone about the location of the LS ASBR, it's a type four. So a type four LSA is utilized to tell everyone where the ASBR is. Now the ASBR will most likely be taking in some prefixes, right? It's going to be taking in some prefixes and it's going to be advertising these external prefixes into the OSPF domain. This is done with type 5 LSAs. Okay, so the type 5 LSA is used to take in these prefixes from the ASBR and advertise them into the topology. There's even something called a type 7 LSA that is used to create not so stubby areas. We'll talk about not so stubby areas in a little bit. So, many different LSA types that really are the underlying beauty of OSPF. Thanks to these different LSA types, we can make L uh, OSPF much more scalable. Notice that there is a type 6 LSA that's actually not supported by Cisco. It's for multicast OSPF, and Cisco decided very early on that they would not support that particular technology. There are types 8, 9, and 10. They're called your opaque LSAs, and they're a key to making the protocol extensible for future modifications. So pretty cool. These LSA types allow us to uh, have this hierarchical structure. LSAs that only flow within an area, for example, are types 1 and 2. These are called our intra-area routes. Types 3 and 4 are used for inter-area routes. Think interstate highway, which I suppose is only relevant if you're in the United States. Sorry to give that U.S. biased analogy there, but here in the United States we have uh, we have these highways that cross state boundaries, and we call them interstates. This is how we can remember inter-area routes. These are our type 3 and type 4s that give us those inter-area routes. And then we know there's type 5s, which give us our external routes. Uh, type 7, if we have one of those special not-so-stubby areas that we have created. Well, speaking of those not so stubby areas, there is the ability in OSPF to create different area types. And once you understand the different types of LSAs that you have, it's very easy to understand this concept of our stub areas. Now, our stub areas are areas that control what LSA types can come into that area. For instance, if we configure a non-transit area as a stub area, it will prevent the external type fives from coming into that area. It's just like this automatic filtering behavior that we get, wonderful, thanks to the creation of a stub area. I was very, very short in high school, so they would call me totally stubby. It was very cruel, very upsetting to me. A totally stubby area in OSPF, it stops the type fives from coming in, and it stops the uh, type fours from coming in. No need for a type four, okay? Uh, it's a lot like this stub area thing, but it also stops the type threes. Wow, so it's totally stubby. It's saying, you know what? We don't care about external prefixes, and we don't care about the details of prefixes from other areas. Now, you may be wondering, <coughs> oh, excuse me, swallowed the wrong way there. You may be wondering, what in the world? I mean, 
if we stop, if, if, if we go in and we configure a totally stubby area, and we stop the type 5s, the type 4s, the type threes from coming in, well, what in the world, what in the world are we going to do to get to those destinations? I mean, are we just not going to be able to contact anything out of our local area? Oh, no, no, not at all. What these, what these area types do, fact, let me show you this, this is so important. What these special area types end up resulting in is the automatic injection of a default route into the area. So if we have like our area zero here, and then we have area 20, and we decide to make area 20, for example, we decide to make it totally stubby. On the ABR, what the ABR will do automatically is it will inject a default static route into the totally stubby area. Why does it inject a default static route automatically into the Area 20 area? Well, if we're blocking the Type 5s, and we're blocking the Type 4s, and we're blocking the Type 3s, it's the area is going to need a default static route to get to destinations outside of its area. So the uh, infrastructure is kind to us. It creates for us this default static route and injects it into the area so these devices do still get to communicate out of their area. Now, let me tell you about the not so stubby area. So we've got our stub area that blocks fours and fives. We've got our totally stubby area that blocks threes, fours, and fives. How about a not so stubby area? What's going on with that? Well, let's say area 30 over here is a not, not so stubby area, an NSSA. What happens with the NSSA is that it's going to block the type fours and fives, right? And it's unique in that it can connect to another domain. And we can have an ASBR in that area. Wow. So even though it's a stub and it's blocking fours and fives, it has the ability to connect to another domain and bring in those prefixes. This is where the LSA type 7 is used. And the type 7 prefixes are carried through the not so stubby area. And then what happens to those prefixes is on the ABR that touches the backbone, they're converted to type 5 LSAs. So pretty interesting. The type 7 LSA is used to move the EIGRP prefixes through the not so stubby area and then they're taken and they're converted to type fives for movement into the backbone for instance. You can even create a hilarious term a totally not so stubby area and now you're blocking threes in addition to the fours and fives into the area. So a totally not so stubby area can also be created. Wow, totally impressive, these many different special areas we can create in OSPF. This makes it a very flexible, very hierarchical routing protocol that is very, very scalable. Notice how we're able to tweak it and tune it for very large environments, thanks to all of these design elements that exist in OSPF. Can we summarize an OSPF? Well, yeah, absolutely we can summarize an OSPF. Very important. We can summarize between areas. We call this internal summarization. 
and it relies upon type 3 LSA summaries. And we can summarize external prefixes. And these, this is where we get into type 5 and type 7 LSAs for summarization. So summarization can be done two different ways in OSPF. And you can't just do it anywhere you want. You can't just place the summarization arbitrarily. You have to summarize on either area border routers to do summarization between areas, or you summarize on ASBRs to summarize external prefixes that are coming in. So lots of great information there that we need to master about OSPF. This may be a lesson in the course that you want to watch a few times. You may want to watch this lesson a few times because obviously there is a lot to OSPF and we find that students that have no experience with it, it takes them, you know, a few times through to master all these concepts. Now, we don't need to talk nearly as long about ISIS. Here's what you need to know about the intermediate system to intermediate system protocol. Okay, the first thing we need to know about it is that it is a pure link state, just like OSPF. As a matter of fact, ISIS was in a heated competition. I should say the proponents of ISIS Okay, the proponents of ISIS, Radia Perlman was one of the famous engineers that was absolutely a proponent of ISIS. They were desperately competing against OSPF for internet-wide acceptance and adoption. But guess what? ISIS lost. ISIS lost the battle. OSPF became the protocol that was adopted by most and the only place we have intermediate system, intermediate system left is in very large service provider environments. Some of those very large service provider environments are still running ISIS for their interior gateway protocol. ISIS is almost identical to OSPF. It's more similar than it is different. It's classless. It uses variable length subnet masking. It can do authentication. Okay. So it is a lot more similar to OSPF than it is different. But there are some key differences, and those differences are what I really want you to be aware of for CCDA purposes. What are the differences? First of all, why large internet service providers uh, are still running it is that it is extremely scalable. As a matter of fact, scalability can do OSPFs in some regards. The main regard would be with the number of routers in an area. So it can outdo OSPF in that regard. And now you see why some service providers might still latch onto it. If they have just some really, really obnoxious number of routers in a single area, well, ISIS starts to look good to them because there are some built-in efficiencies when compared to OSPF for that type of situation. Something else with the ISIS protocol is the fact that it's not as strict. It is not as strict with the area concept. What you have is you have this backbone concept that it, it's, it's not as rigid like the OSPF structure, okay? You have these level one, level two routers, and the area border concept is simply on a router that can do both, internal and backbone routing. So you go ahead and you connect 
these L1, L2 routers together to make sure that your backbone concept is flowing throughout the topology. And then, you know, these can connect to level one only routers. So it's a much more flexible type of backbone design. By the way, remember how in the OSPF environment, we had the concept of the designated router, and this would be a router on a broadcast media that was the king of the hill for the adjacencies. There is the same concept in ISIS, but it's called the designated intermediate system. So instead of the designated router, it's called the designated intermediate system. And one thing that's interesting, one subtle difference is there is no backup designated intermediate system like there is in OSPF. So that would be another subtle distinction. There is no concept of special area types you notice in ISIS. It's just this concept of level one internal routers and level two backbone routers. There's no special concept of special areas like we had in OSPF. Another really strange difference is the metric. The metric with ISIS, it's not based on cost or, excuse me, it's not based on bandwidth. It's called the default metric. And it is a default metric of a simple value of 10 by default on Cisco routers. It's basically like a hop count. Yeah, the ISIS metric is basically like a hop count. So you better go in there and you better manipulate that metric if you want to take bandwidth into consideration with your ISIS pallet. It's up to you to go in and engineer changes in that default metric value in order to engineer path selection based on bandwidth. So, ISIS, more similar than different, but I did want to, and I've done that here on this slide, I did want to cover with you the unique properties of ISIS compared to OSPF. As a matter of fact, one more thought on the differences. One of the issues that we have with ISIS is that few people know about it, right? So one of the things you need to consider from a design perspective with ISIS is, do any engineers that are in the company, do any of them have any knowledge about ISIS? You certainly don't want to recommend this as a protocol if you've got engineers in the company that have never heard of the protocol. So we got to watch out for that when we are considering intermediate system to intermediate system. Well, let's wrap up this lesson with a little review as we love to do. Describe the OSPF ADR. Then describe the OSPF ASBR. Okay, well, this should be easy enough for us to do. First, the OSPF area border router. The AS OSPF area border router, yeah, sure, that's a very important router. It's going to exist between the backbone area and a non-backbone area. And it is used to pass prefix information from the non-transit area to the transit area. That's its job. Now, an ASBR, an autonomous system boundary router, its job, so this is like R1 and this is going to be R2, its job is to connect to some non-OSPF domain. The autonomous system boundary router's job is to connect to some non-OSPF domain and take in those external prefixes into the OSPF domain. A little review here, inside an area, 
we have LSA types one and two. In between areas, we have type three LSAs. To announce the ASBR, we use a type four LSA, and to bring in external prefix tests, type five LSA. So we're really giving uh, the CCDA examiner the explanation they want, right? We can not only educate the CCDA examiner about the area border router and the autonomous system boundary router, but we can even go a step further and we can tell them what the underlying LSA impact is. Pretty cool. And we know that this all leads to a discussion of our special area types. Well, great work, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this exploration of OSPF and intermediate system. Next up here in CCPA, we need to do master design issues when it comes to a very, very important protocol. Oh, so important. It gives us our modern internet. It's called the Border Gateway Protocol. That is next.